And we are back for a segment with Intro Ebo Adaltari Day. No, that's again not his real name. He's been on the show a few times. A a very good friend to the show, smart guy working up in New York as a lawyer. And in this job, he has gotten to work on many, I'm sure, fascinating topics and subjects. And today we're going to discuss one that is really I don't know if interesting the word is the word. It's it's uh, terrifying, I think, more than anything else. And that is the Waldorf School. So, Introibo, thank you so much again for coming on. And yeah, I don't know where you want to begin, but let's let's hit it. All right, thanks for having me, Kevin. And I will talk about the Waldorf Schools because this is part of what I have discussed in my blog and various posts as part of the quote unquote occult explosion or the occult invasion. And as of been doing this post now since 2010 and in its current form since 2000, September 2014, actually exactly uh, eight years, I've noticed how ubiquitous the occult is in our society and in ways that most people don't understand or know. And as I've done the research, uh, it is quite scary because the occult is a way, uh, when people get involved with the occult, knowingly or otherwise, they're opening a door to, the, to evil, to hell to Satan. And you speak many times, I've heard you speak about, you know, we're at war with uh, powers and principalities and things like that. And it very is, uh, it very truly is spiritual warfare. And the spiritual warfare, I think, goes on battlefields that most people are unaware. Uh, this was one um, that came as a specific shock to me. You know, I'm almost 60 years old. Not that many things will shock me, unfortunately especially coming from New York as an attorney, and you just see, like, everything. And this did. This really did. What happened was, prior to becoming a an attorney, I was a New York City science teacher for five years. I worked in the public schools. I was tenured. And then, uh, I, long story short, I just decided I was, uh, for various reasons, I voluntarily resigned my position, and I went to law school, and the rest, as they say, is history. So uh, I know very much about education, uh, and I have a master's degree in science education. I sometimes get uh, cases from teachers, which is uh, not unusual. And many times my firm will take, will have one of us go out, one of the associates go out to the person and do an intake if they can't make it in for various reasons. So this one time, uh, I'll call the woman Ellen, that's not her real name. I was asked to go see Ellen, and she told me she worked at a Waldorf school uh, out in the suburbs. I was like, okay, fine, you know, I'll make time. And as I said, well, gee, Waldorf school. Now, in my graduate classes in the late 80s and early 90s, undergraduates, never we, never, we only dealt with public education. And as undergrads, we were exposed to, like, Montessori schools, uh, which were Maria Montessori was a devout Roman Catholic, and she died in 1952. And Waldorf schools were also mentioned as, you know, these alternative means of education. There's also magnet schools and charter schools. And Waldorf schools were basically presented to us as uh, where rich parents sent their kids for like a hippie type education so they didn't have to work too hard and because they were going to be taken care of anyway. At least that's how it was presented. And I said, this will be interesting. This will be my first time ever going to a Waldorf school because I've never been to one before. And there's about, uh, it's expensive. I know that uh, it goes from kindergarten to uh, the end of high school, the K to 12. And an education there will run you when all is said and done about $235,000 for one kid. Whoa. This is not cheap. All right. And they also have what's called, um, an education is called looping and that you only have one, at most, three teachers for your entire 12 years. They stay with you the whole time. So that you feel an attachment to them as if they're your mother or your father, depending upon, you know, uh, if you have a guy or a girl. And I don't know if they have transgenders yet, but that's another subject for another day. Um, there's about 1,100 of these Waldorf schools in, in the world, and uh, 160 are in the United States of America. So I went to this, and I met her. I got there about uh, about 40 minutes before the end of the school day. The main office let me in. Uh, they knew they knew to expect me. I'm walking around, and I thought I was in an alternate universe. There's no technology whatsoever, no computers. The phones are on the wall. I mean, there's no. I was the only one with an iPhone, and that was probably the most sophisticated piece of equipment. And the students, I'm looking around as they're taking me on this tour. You know, they, they were gracious. They sent me on a tour. 
and my tour guide was uh, someone in the main office. And none of the kids are uh, in uniforms, as I expected, because most schools, like private schools, they have some sort of uniform, no uniforms. Right. And there was no, if you're looking for reading, writing, arithmetic, you're not going to find it here. Uh, one was strumming a guitar, and they were singing folk songs. Uh, the other one was out in the courtyard, and they were finger painting. Others were in uh, a room, and the teacher was reciting poetry as they just sat there and, and were basically like sleeping. And there was one room, it scared me because it looked like the kids were um, those Protestant snake handlers when they all start jumping and hallelujah and everybody say, yeah, yeah, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah it, was, it was like that. And I'm like, what is this? You know, there's, there's nobody reading, there's nobody writing, there's nobody really learning anything. And then I met Ellen. They took me to the teacher's lounge. She came in and I said, this is so laid back. You know, I might have reconsidered my decision to go into law. I said, I should teach here. And she goes, oh, you could never teach here. Like almost indignant. I'm like, why? And she said, well, uh, I said, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a licensed uh, New York State science teacher and my license is good for life. She goes, that's not the point. She goes, you have to be trained in the me methodology of Rudolf Steiner. So I said, uh, well, wasn't he some sort of a, a scientist and something and a psychologist? And she goes, you have to go get a certification for three years in the methodology of Rudolf Steiner before they'll let you in. That was true. That was the absolute truth. So we got back down to the business and that was it. And uh, I took the intake. I brought it back to my office. But now I'm really interested in, you know, Rudolf Steiner and this whole thing. So I remember the name, hearing the name somewhere else. Now, basically, that's what... Uh, that what I was told is that he was some sort of a scientist and a psychologist, but I'll, I'll bring it up to you. Really. I'm going to, I know it sounds, this is going to sound like an episode of the twilight zone, but you know, I haven't lost my marbles. Uh, it, it really is true, but I'm going to give you the long and the short of it. Rudolf Steiner was an occultist and a Freemason. And the goal of his educational method was to train children to become clairvoyance and make contact with the spirit world. What? That, yeah. And most of the people sending their kids there don't even know it. I had a friend, uh, an attorney who worked with me, uh, older than I was, uh, his wife was much younger and he had kids late in life and his daughter was going to, uh, a Waldorf school. And he was like, uh, you know, she brings me home, like, you know, pictures of unicorns and pumpkins and, you know, I, what am I paying for? So when I, when I told him the information that I got, which I'm about to relate to you, he went the very next day and pulled his daughter out the very next day. Wow. So it is, uh, so what is uh, a Waldorf school? Well, first of all, uh, let's get into Rudolf Steiner just a little bit. So you have the background of uh, Rudolf Steiner. Uh, Rudolf Steiner, as I said, he was an occultist and he was a, um, uh, he was a Freemason admitted and Steiner's idea, uh, the first school opened on Steiner's idea was in 1919 in response to a request from a person named Emil Molt, M-O-L-T. He was the owner and managing director of the Waldorf Astoria Cigarette Company in Stuttgart, Germany, hence the name Waldorf School. Right? Mm -hmm. Because that's nothing to do with the hotel, as some people in, you know, in New York will think of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. It's, that's not related. Uh, and the teachers, Waldorf faculties usually acknowledge that their educational approach arises from anthroposophy. Anthroposophy, not to be confused with, uh, you know, the science of uh, uh, anthropology, which is something complete, completely and totally fine and different. Right? Anthroposophy is a an, is an occult uh, religion and was actually condemned by Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office. And they teach it their uh, they teach their anthroposophical doctrines to their students. Uh, they say that they don't, and in a restricted sense, it's true, but in the larger sense, it's false. Because, and I'm quoting here from Steiner's own material: "You need not make the children aware they are receiving the objective truth, meaning his truth of anthroposophy. And if this occasionally appears anthroposophical, it's not anthroposophy that is at fault. Things are." that way in a Waldorf school because anthroposophy has something to say about objective truth. It is the material that causes 
causes what is said to be anthroposophical. We certainly may not go to the other extreme where people say that anthroposophy may not be taught in the school. Anthroposophy will be in the school when it is objectively justified, that is, when it is called for by the material itself. So anthroposophists believe that their doctrines are the great universal truth underlying all other knowledge. It's very Gnostic. And uh, it is justified at every point in the curriculum studied. They will inject it into everything. And the idea is to delay students reading as long as possible. They don't start reading till they're about in the third grade. And the reason what? for that is because they, yeah. Now, studies have been done. I wanted to see how educated are these people if you're not learning to read until you're nine years old. Yeah, right, exactly. Interestingly, interestingly, uh, the secular studies that I've read uh, in published journals show that in the early grades, obviously, there's a huge gap between public schools and private schools, other private schools, and the Waldorf schools. But by the time they get into the eighth and ninth grade, uh, they actually perform a little bit better, which is why I don't know. I can tell you as a professional educator, I don't understand it. Clairvoyance, but maybe. The clairvoyance <laughs> might be. Maybe the deans tell them. I don't know. Oh, yeah, it could be. Uh, so... It, 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 Interestingly, they don't call themselves religious schools, even though that they are. And uh, the teachers are told uh, one of the major signatures of the Swallow School uh, is the delayed reading, as I said. And they present research on delay reading. But the reason for delaying the reading is based not on the educational evidence, like I just cited to you, but he believed it was bad for the child's soul development. That is a quote from him, soul development, because he believed in uh, evolution, not just evolution of the body, but evolution of the soul. So, yeah, yeah. This, yeah you got to stand with me here because this is this is real wild ride. All right. So reincarnation does not happen all at once at birth, but develops over the seven year cycles. At birth, a child is given their physical body. See, and at age seven, when their teeth develop, whichever one comes first, they get their etheric body, whatever that means. I don't know. And at 14, their astral body. So for Steiner, reincarnation is not just to be reborn after death, but it's a continual process through each life. And what these designations mean, nobody knows. And the reason why they don't have computers and all this other stuff, technology is shunned as coming from evil. He never goes into detail as to why, but that's why they don't use, and you'll never see anything technological in a Waldorf school. Now, Eurythmy is what I is the name uh, of what I witnessed with those kids dancing around. And it's mystical dancing performed by the anthroposophists uh, and their students at Waldorf schools. This Cory Bantic, you know, uh, snake handling type dancing is called visible speech. And they say if they open up their minds and let the spirits in, all right, and to try to contact their spirit guide. What? And it is obligatory. If any child refuses to dance, they're expelled. It is obligatory. All right. And those who don't participate, like I said, in your with me, the parents are called and they said, your child is what they do, though. They don't say it's because he's not going to dance. They don't tell you that. The you with me. They said it's because he's defiant. They'll put it like as a defiance disorder. No, oh, he's defiant. He's oppositional defiance disorder. That's that's the technical name for it. That's what they frame it as because they won't dance. And basic math skills aren't introduced in the lower grades, but only lightly, very lightly. The same holds for the other subjects. And generally, they enter the classroom in a romanticized form. Uh, they have an introduction to life sciences, because I was a science teacher. I was interested in that. But it consists of nature stories. It's really not any, you know, you're not really teaching any scientific concepts or the scientific method. And exposure to foreign languages may begin in the lower grades, but without the formal study of the vocabulary or the grammar. They just learn a couple of words by sight, sight and recite. Some it's called the C, the, uh, the, the C recognize and say method. And they, the, the activities that are pushed are water coloring, knitting, knitting and gardening, singing and reciting poetry. So they're deemed to be have esoteric value. And the parents aren't informed as to the full rationale for this. Uh, the teachers try to provide slow learning so the child will be open to the spiritual evolution, to the spirits coming in them. And the goal is to make 
contacts the spirit world and evolve to their highest potential. They won't say that to the parents. And as a matter of fact, Steiner actually says, do not say this to the parents. Anthropos, anthropos that's a hard word to say. It is. Uh, it, the, the, that philosophy uh, has, has its own press, which talks about, and it has several booklets, which I got. I was able to find them, I got them, and I read through them, and it tells you what Steiner's educational theories were. They, and he says these things flat out. All right, so um, that's as far as, you know, uh, anthroposophy itself. Let me get into that. Um, well, so I'm going to, the, the, my sources for this, I could cite them later if you'd like, but anthrop anthroposophic press. Uh, is called that it's a series of books called the foundations of Waldorf education. That's the title. If anyone's interested in looking it up, be my guest. So Steiner was born in 1861 and died in 1925. And you give, a, they give a very sanitized version of this man's life when I was in graduate school, where he was a psychologist and a scientist specializing in child psychology. Um, no, uh, that is not the truth. Uh, he considered Anthro, anthrop anthroposophy is a spiritual science, which was a path of knowledge aiming to guide the spiritual element in the human being to the spiritual in the universe. All right, he was born in uh, Austria, the son of an Austrian railroad engineer, and he pursued his undergraduate education at the Vienna Institute of Technology. And he supplemented his scientific studies with wide reading in philosophy. He earned a PhD in philosophy at the University of Rostock in 1891, and he joined the Freemasonic Lodge. He became interested in the occult at the age of nine. And at nine years old, he said he saw the soul of his aunt appear to him and ask him for help. And he found out the next day she had died at that same time in a village far away. So he became interested now in uh, the occult. And he was originally inducted into theosophy. Uh, and in, 18, in 1899, Steiner experienced what he described as his life transforming inner encounter with the being of Christ. Now, being a Freemason, he hated Christ and everything that Christ stands for. But his relationship to Christianity remained entirely founded upon his personal experience of what he thought and envisioned it as a non denominational, all accepting. Uh, you can believe whatever you want type of Catholicism. Sound interest? Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, right. Sounds like kind of what we got going on today. Huh? Exactly. So he split with the other theosophists to form this anthroposophy um, in 1912 after they accepted an Indian child named Krishnamurti as the new world teacher and the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And he ridiculed the idea that a Hindu kid uh, could be the new cosmic leader. And so he took with him the German-speaking theosophists and founded his occult religion called Anthroposophy. And 1912 was considered its founding, its founding year. Today, it has approximately 52,000 members. It's called the General Anthroposophical Society and has branches in 50 countries, 50 countries. And what they have, uh, the initiatives they have started was the Waldorf Network of Schools, biodynamic movement in agriculture, uh, urethmy, which is used outside the school as well, and Campbell Network of Intentional Communities, which is a religious sect known as the Christian community, and they live according to these anthroposophical, um, anthroposophical principles. And they're in medicine, architecture, banking, speech, care for the disabled. They really want to get into all layers of society. Now, Rudolf Steiner, uh, what makes him so influential was I was reading um, uh, was uh, reading a book called Rudolf Steiner as a Religious Authority by Tori Albach, and she writes Steiner's alleged ability to see into the hidden was the attribute that primarily separated him from other people. Steiner lived in a vision, and he could talk with prophets and saints about their experiences as an equal, and people bought into this. They actually thought he was talking to these people. And the visionary ability is given the explanation to his knowledge of things religious. Steiner could see into the invisible world. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the Bruce Willis movie, I see dead people, that kind of thing. <laughs> or, or Mormonism. It reminds Mormonism. me of Mormonism. Is it, uh, yeah, I, I, I found all these these rules written in Egyptian in a, with, with like golden spectacles that no one else can see. And it's just, 
it's just like uh, this isn't real, right? And you say fifty thousand people believe in this. I was like, man, I, I I thought there were crazy people in the world, but there's a lot more than I would have imagined. Oh yeah, uh, but the, what he's doing to the what he's doing to kids is really opening them up to the occult, uh, to the occult and demonic possession i mean don't forget uh christ when he came across uh, a demon possessed man and he asked how long has he been like that they said since birth since a child i believe since i believe the correct the correct uh, translation is since a child so we know that children can be possessed and they asked him to call out upon spirits and enter their bodies well you know uh and they are a cult so um you know, uh, he went on and he wants the children to communicate like him with the dead. And that's really what they're doing. So to the clairvoyance is to make uh, contact with the dead and to bring these spirits into them to help with their evolution, the spiritual and physical evolution. And you want to talk about strange doctrines, okay? I'm, just, I'm telling you, this is like from the Looney Tunes. This man should be in should be in a padded room, not teaching children. You know, or starting an educational. Uh, th these I took these directly from the foundations of Waldorf education, which I cited. All right, everything involves and there's reverse evolution, where certain people have become animals. Well, now, I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean, are we talking literally or? <laughs> um, Everybody has several bodies. The physical body, which is composed of the material elements, same as you know, plants and animals. Then the etheric body, which I mentioned before, is the life body that is common to animals, plants, and humans. And then you have the astral or soul body that is possessed by animals and is the eye that is uniquely human. So what we would commonly call the soul is the, uh, is the astral body. And our evolutionary progress began not on the planet Earth, but in Saturn. Did you right? This planet was reincarnated in phases corresponding to the sun and the moon, making our Earth the fourth in what will be an ongoing series of incarnations. Uh, people are born with 12 senses, but only learn to use five. And that's why they use the choreobantic dancing to open up the other senses that we don't use. He never goes on to say what those seven senses are, but... And uh, goblins are real, and Buddha lives on Mars. Now, yeah, and people are spending eighteen thousand dollars a year to send their kids there. And now here's the now here's an interesting thing: it's a contact with Vatican II. There is a direct link to Vatican II. And guess who was into Rudolf Steiner and considered himself uh, was so interested that he was pulled from his teaching position because of it. A guy by the name of Angelo Roncalli. Ah, it was Steiner. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's disturbing. It was uh, in 1924, after the death of the bishop who protected him, Tedeschi, uh, Roncalli was brought back to Rome and given a minor post in the propagation of the faith. And he became a professor of patristics at the Lateran University. And he was relieved from his post in months on suspicion of modernism and teaching the Occult theories of Rudolf Steiner. Well, Steiner includes calling spirits into your body. So, and then who else was involved? Carol Wotila. What? Was involved. Wotila was a close friend with, I'm, not, I'm going to skip the first thing only because I'm not good at pronouncing uh, these uh Eastern European names that are extremely low. I love Polish people. I really do. Uh, Joanna. Just is one of my, uh, you know, she wrote the guest post for me. She's from Poland. I love her. Uh, great person. Uh, but I have a hard time with these names. His last name is Kuplarsik. Kuplarsik. And he was the director of the Raps Rhapsodic Theater, which he co-founded uh, with Wotila. And he was an anthrop anthroposophist who admired and believed the doctrines of Steiner. And his plays were productions of Rud Rudolf Steiner's mystery dramas. And Kutlarsik wrote a book, The Art of the Living World, Diction, Expression, and Magic. Magic. I and mean, I'm not talking about magic tricks here, a sleight of hand, you know, pull the rabbit out of the hat. We're talking about calling upon the spirit world. Do you know who published it? The Gregorian University in 1975. What? It was approved, yes, it was approved by Montini. 
You can't make this stuff up. At the request of Otila, who at that time, I believe, was already a cardinal. So can you imagine in 1955, Pope Pius XII approving that that evil garbage to be published under the name of the Gregorian University? It's insane. So, uh, the, you know, it goes back to theosophy with uh, Madame Helena Blavatsky. And we all know how deeply involved she was with Satanism and all the rest of it. And in 1919, the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office condemned theosophy and forbade Catholics to read anything they published. Anthropos... Anthropos... I'm never going to get through this word, Kevin. <laughs> Anthroposoph- anthroposophy. Anthroposophy is simply a derivation of theosophy with a lot of strange stuff thrown in. So it would also logically fall under the condemnation. So... Um, well, and just by common right? sense, it seems like this would fall under a con- condemnation. I mean, this is clearly, very clearly not Catholic. I mean, I mean, it is as esoteric and disturbing as anything I think I've heard in terms of of, of occultism, at least. That, that's, that's, that's insane. And the, the preface to the book, the preface to the book was written by Cardinal Wotila. And here's exactly what he has. I'm going to quote the book. I've got it. <laughs> here's what it says. Quote, Writing these words that precede Dr. Kutlarski's three-part work, I wish to repay a debt of gratitude to the author. I knew, uh, I first knew Dr. Kutlarski in our native town of Wadawis, I'm going to say, in the late 20s and 30s. Don't, uh, you got to help me with my Polish. I got to know him as the pioneer of the original theater and the noblest sense of the word as an exponent of the true Christian traditions of that art. Traditions passed on to us by all our literature and especially by the great romantic and neo-romantic literature given at Rome the 6th of November 1974, signed Carol Cardinal Wotila, Metropolitan of Krakow. Who else was in this? Father Hans Urs von Balthasar, the heretic who says that everybody goes to heaven. All right, Van Balthasar, as you know, was a modernist who supported uh, heretics and wrote in favor of the heretics of Vatican II. He preached universalism, uh, which some of the so-called conservative Vatican II sect members deny, even as a sect itself preaches universalism. But Van Balthasar was praised by both Wotila as Pope and Ratzinger as the so-called Pope. And JP II actually named him a cardinal in 1988, but he died two days before his promotion would have taken effect. He's not really a theologian. His doctorate was in German literature and philosophy. So he's not a theologian or a canonist, yet he was permitted to to act as one at the council, which should not be. He was, he shouldn't have been a paradise. Uh, Van Balthasar wrote a very laudatory preface to the book by Valentin Tomberg, an admitted member of anthrop- anthropos- anthroposophy and self-described hermetic magician. Whatever that appellation means, I don't know. Tomberg later converted to the Eastern Schismatics and became Catholic in 1946, but there's one problem. Tomberg's conversion was insincere. And how do I know that? He wrote a book entitled Meditations on Tarot Cards in in 1960, which was shortened to Meditations on the Tarot. That was the the second name given to it, which is for the promotion of reincarnation. And it was published posthumously in 1967 in French and in 1984 in English. I have the 1984 edition. Okay, Von Balthasar wrote the foreword to the French edition. And here's what he has to say. Um, having been asked to write an introduction to this book, which for most readers enters into unknown terrain and yet so richly compelling, rewarding to read, I must first of all acknowledge my lack of competence concerning the subject matter. I am not in a position to follow up and approve of each line of thought developed by the author, and still less to submit everything to critical examination. However, such an abundance of noteworthy material is offered here that one may not pass by it with indifference. All right, immediately you have to ask, why would an educated cleric like von Balthasar write a glowing foreword to a work that contains an occult title? You can't tell me he didn't know what tarot cards were. That 
uh, claims no competence. He's not competent. So why are you writing a forward something that you're incompetent? And has glaring occult and heretical teachings like reincarnation. He didn't know reincarnation was against the Catholic faith. It was appointed man to die but once. He never heard that before. So Von Balthasar was either culpably ignorant or purposefully deceptive. I let your listeners decide. I've already made up my mind. All right. And Von Balthasar is a hero to his to was is a hero to guess who? Quote unquote Bishop Robert Barron who's now in charge of a diocese in the United States and his word on fire. Well, there's something on fire and it's not going to be uh, his word. Uh, and he undermines the very raison d'etre for his stated mission in promoting von Balthasar. Because why do you need to convert to anything if we're all going to go to heaven anyway? So that, that's uh, the, one of the ultimate questions of, of the Nova Soto, right? Of Vatican, of Vatican II. You know, what's what's the point of having a religion at all if if everyone's good? And it, I just recently saw a quote of Pope Leo the Thirteenth where he said, "If if you believe all, what does he say? If you believe all religions are equal, then you may as well be an atheist, I mean, it's, or it's the same as atheism, something of the sort." And it's it's yeah, basically true, right? And there, here's the scary part. I went to see who exactly. Uh, who else was given a Waldorf education? Because Waldorf education opens you to the occult, and you went to, well is a cult, and it opens you to demonic possession. Here are some small sample of notables I found: American actress Jennifer Aniston and Sandra Bullock, both graduates of Waldorf school education. The CEO of American Express, Kenneth Chenault, who who retired recently, very influential, very prominent. The American film director, Austin Schick, uh, renowned biochemist, Dr. Thomas Sudoff, former member of the Finnish parliament, Oras uh, Tinkinian, and was the first admitted sodomite elected, and Norwegian author, Lynn Ullman, who sold many, many books, are all in this um, anthroposophy, uh, occultism, Waldorf education. And there are many actors and actresses and uh, politicians who send their kids to these schools to be educated, who will find their places in the world and spread the message of occultism. And that's what I found out about Waldorf schools. Well, and, and how important is the message to make sure you know what your kids are learning at school, right? And that, that's pretty incredible. And I think that's something we, we learned during the, the COVID pandemic as well, that the kids were having to do school at home and the parents actually got to be able to see a little bit of what was being taught. And uh, well, let's just say homeschooling numbers increased. <laughs> and, and, I think that's, yeah. and it shows you, I mean, I mean that, that's a scary thing. And if you can be sending your kids to a school like this and you don't even know that they're learning occultism, when the founder, clearly that was his entire agenda, whew, scary. And, you know, as an educated man, I mean, you know, we're talking about a senior associate in my law firm who has since retired. I mean, this, this guy was no dummy. Well, let me right. tell you, when I showed him the books, Foundations of Waldorf Education, he was like, how did I not know this stuff? He was like, I mean, like, seriously, he looked like he, he lost the color in his cheeks. He was like, my daughter's getting out of there immediately. He went and he pulled her out the very next day. Uh, he goes, anything is better than this. He goes, my God, you know, goblins and you know, all this other stuff and spirits and, and the dancing. He goes, I was wondering why they're dancing all the time. And I said, well, it's the, for, I actually met a Waldorf teacher and I asked her, I said, you know, why do they do that? I knew what the answer was. I wanted to see what she would say. She goes, oh, well, you know how kids don't really understand their bodies and where they're positioned. They're kind of like very clumsy. We teach them to be less clumsy. Oh, yeah, right. I said, you mean like the spirit world? And she looked at me. Like with one of those, like, how did you know that type of thing? And I just walked away. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. That's, wow. I mean, that, that's really incredible to learn and, and really disturbing and fascinating how you can connect it to to the Nova Soto Church. And, and it just, it again shows, I mean, even, and even then the connections to Freemasonry. I, I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to see that the fruits of Vatican II and those who promulgated it are, are rotten. I mean, really rotten. Not not just kind of stink. It's bad. I mean, it's really bad. And all you have to do is do a little bit of research. And this is fascinating that you found this out. I mean, you know, dive into a little bit of this stuff, and um, it's there that the evidence exists that, that these men who promulgated this could could not 
possibly have been popes, no less Catholics. Correct. Vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't be either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Well, no, I, I, I really appreciate. It. I, I really appreciate you coming on. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's disturbing, but it's good to know, and I think it's an eye opener to, to, to show. Yeah, be careful. Be careful. Everything that your kids are putting into your head, into their heads, everything they're learning, have a real handle on what's going into their because because they, they're so moldable as we see that they, they are going to be shaped by what they're taught at school or by you and boy you, you don't want them learning something like this though i mean do we really know that buddha is not on the moon i mean we don't, <laughs> we don't know i mean it, it's possible <laughs> or mars i'm sorry it was mars anyway intro Evo, i really appreciate it thank you so much for coming on if anyone enjoyed this podcast and wants to check out more of his material he produces material every mon monday and it's always awesome I, I read it every single week you can find that at intro Evo at altari day two dot blogspot.com i know you probably have no idea how to spell that so i will attach a link in the show notes again intro Evo, thank you so much for coming on i hope we can do it again sometime sometime you stumble across another crazy connection of, of occultism and, and the Novus Ordo, I will be glad to hear from you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. All right. God bless.